Oh, oh. Yeah. Yeah, luckily I I I have uh Naomi to uh press the record button because I've I've kind of blown it on a couple occasions where they um they call me up after and they go, Hey, uh, can you send us the link to the recording? And I'm like, oops. Um, you mean the recording like go the one we just did? And then like, yeah. Okay. All right. <clears throat> hey everybody. Uh uh, welcome. Uh it's it's Saturday, so another time to uh to get together and uh talk about uh all things uh rotary. And so um Naomi and I have our little uh Singapore background up uh because a week from now uh, we'll be in the sweltering heat of well, so will Vern. A, a bunch of you guys on the screen are gonna go, right? Um so you'll be over there in Singapore. So who's been to Singapore before? Yeah, Murray, you've been to Singapore. Cool. So you know to bring your dry fit shirts, right? You don't want to be sweating over there. I tell you, it's a wonderful, great yeah. place. Great. Yeah, I've watched, I've watched like a million videos. I mean, since I decided to go, every, every night, uh, my wife and I, we just watch some video on Singapore, so and it's a it's an amazing story, and it's a exactly it's zero potholes, no potholes. The public transportation system is terrific. Yep, and and no rubbish. You know the no rubbish. I was, the, I was watching these videos of these tourists that come over there, and they they say right away the thing that strikes them is they walk <laughs> around and they got their video camera. Look, there's not even a cigarette butt on the ground. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, there's no jaywalking. If you do get an Uber, it gets there in 30 seconds. I don't know. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Okay. And the street but, food. And the street food. Yeah. yeah. It's awesome. Uh, Hawker's, Hawker's, yeah. Hawker's I'm, Court. Go to Hawker's Court because okay. it's cheap. It's super clean. And you get all kinds of different Asian foods. Yeah, I've been dreaming. Actually, I've been excited to go. And actually, I, you know, want to admit to all of you, that I, I'm going mostly because I want to eat all the stuff that I've seen on these videos. It just looks pretty, pretty amazing. So, okay, so uh, let's get going. I uh, thanks for joining us today. So we're gonna we're gonna go over um, just some leadership things, and and some of you um, have kind of seen this presentation, but I actually. Every time I do it, I, I change it. So you can't say, hey, I already saw that whole thing. You're probably going to see parts of it, but um, but some of them, some of them, uh, you know, new stuff I've just added in. But uh, let's see who's over here. Uh, Joni, I just saw you last week at the conference. Vern was at the conference. Lila was there. Calvin was there. Tracy was there. Wow. Murray was there. Lorraine, we missed you, but hey, no problem. <laughs> okay. All right, let's uh, let's get going. Before we get started, any uh, any questions about anything? Okay, good. That's what I like. Really smart group. Um, you know, I I used to uh, take these trainings. You know, when I, I first started in kind of a technical field, and the and the whole buzz around the room was like, don't ask any questions because then we'll get over faster and we can go home quicker, right? Mm -hmm. And so I would write all my questions down. So they look at you. All right, let's get started. Uh, let's see. Okay, so some of you might have uh, seen the beginning of this. Let me get this thing set up here. Okay, I'm doing this on two screens. So um, are you seeing the screen that just has just has the uh, um, the slide on it, or can you see the next slide too? Yeah, the next one's over on the side, Benson. Okay, good. Let me yeah. let do me... the slideshow. Slideshow. Yeah, hang on. Wait, let me just change this. Well, I, I just have to reverse it on my um okay. We're seeing um the slide plus your notes. So that um yeah, go to presenter view. Yeah, there okay, you good, go. good. good. Technology, man. How about that? Isn't that kind of cool? Okay, so we're gonna talk about um <clears throat> rotary leadership in Hawaii, and we're gonna talk uh, about Aloha Spirit and um how to build leadership. Uh, within our district. Now, you know, a, a lot of this is based on this belief that I have is that a lot of the stuff that Rotary espouses, um, you know, worldwide 
uh, that a lot of those things are kind of baked into our culture already. Uh, so I wanted to point some of those things out because as you sort of start your leadership or continue your leadership journey, um, uh, some of those things might be more relevant to you and, and easier to get across if people have a cultural reference. Okay. All right. So um, Rotary came up, I think, over a decade ago with a basically a new uh, vision, right? And their vision was together to see a world where people unite and take action to create lasting change across the globe in our communities and in ourselves. Now, you know, you can read those, world, uh, those words, but um, the key words, obviously, that they want to emphasize is together. All right, because we we have to do this together as a group because, um, you know, without all of the clubs and the people that are in Rotary uh, can't can't really people can't really unite to take action. Now, action is an important thing, but what what Rotary wants to do is create lasting change. All right. So we can take action. We're talking about taking action today, but we're also going to talk about um, change and how change occurs and change occurs, as a lot of you know, uh, first in yourself, you see a change, and then we can start changing our communities uh, and, of course, our entire globe. So when I, when I first got into Rotary, um, I was convinced that Rotary uh, is really a service organization, and it is. And we provide, you know, service in our communities, and we do this across our communities and our in our state across our nation, across the entire world. Um, and when I when I read the four-way test and then and then the slogan of Rotary is really service above self, I said, okay, well, this is the reason I'm in Rotary is because Rotary is a service organization. And that's one thing that's always really attracted me to Rotary. So as I got into um, the leadership of the district and started um, in leadership development, um, and that's, you know, thanks to my partner in crime, Naomi, over there, who got me into this. Um, I became convinced that Rotary is really a leadership organization. Because um, if you take a if you take a look at what Rotary says, right, they say the base of Rotary is in our clubs, right? So, you know, 46,000 clubs, 1.4 million Rotarians, and what everybody says is, you know, the base of what Rotary does is in our clubs. And, and obviously that's true, right? But if we don't have leadership to lead our clubs, uh, then it's a, it's a pretty easy equation, right? Uh, no leadership, no club, no Rotary, right? So, so I became really, um, really behind the concept of helping to develop leadership in Rotary. So, you know, up until about a year ago, I was convinced that Rotary is not just a service organization, but it's a leadership organization. Um, but really what, I, what I've come to learn, and maybe you guys have this experience and we can kind of talk about it a little bit, is I've come to understand, at least uh, for me, what I see is that Rotary is really a relationship organization. And all the things that either happen in Rotary that are that are that are great, and even some of the not so great things, they're all about the relationships that we have in in Rotary. Um, because when I when I first got into Rotary, I was thinking, oh, all right, because my my sister, I don't want to say she tricked me into it, but she told me, hey, you want to have lunch? And when I showed up, there were all these people in the room uh, that were Rotarians, and the next thing. I knew the next week I was being inducted into the club, which is okay. Because I thought to myself, um, you know, I could use Rotary uh, to advance my business. And I think a lot of people start in with Rotary and they start thinking that, right? Um, but then, you know, as I began to see that Rotary, Rotary is about leadership, and then as I sort of advanced my evolution about it, and began to see that Rotary is really about the relationships. And, and it was the relationships that I made in Rotary that really solidified my dedication to Rotary. So um, I actually felt uh, felt kind of embarrassed that when I looked back, I thought, wow, you know, 
um, I could do something great for me, for my business, when when really it was about uh, the depth of the relationships that I had in Rotary. So anybody want to want to comment on that on that? Because I I kind of want today to be uh, more of a dialogue. So um, I can't see everybody. So I'm just going to call out people by random, like like Dennis. I can see Dennis. Jeez, oh, thanks, Benson. Yeah, what's your, what's your thought, Dennis? No, here's here's my thought. Everything everything you're saying is spot on. Um, I think the biggest thing about Rotary when somebody comes in, like you mentioned, when you went to your first meeting with your sister, you really have to catch the spirit. And by that I mean, um, when it, when somebody comes into Rotary. You know, if your club is super active, that's number one. I mean, you've got to have activities to keep people coming back. Just coming to a weekly <laughs> meeting is nice and listening to a yeah. speaker is nice, but that's not what Rotary is about at all. You know, you've got to have service activities and, and other things. So that uh, just a real quick story. When my oldest daughter, <clears throat> I was a widower at the time, and my oldest daughter started in Girl Scouts, right? So I didn't know anything about Girl Scouts, but I knew where the meeting was. So I took her down to this meeting and was going to drop her off. And, <clears throat> you know, I started to leave and the, all, all the adults there went, where are you going? I go, well, I'm just going to drop my daughter off. And they said, oh, no, 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 you, you need to sit down here. So they said, okay, so she's getting a Girl Scout. So number one, here's what's expected of you. You know, like you need to bring treats every month. Uh, there's this parent activity. We need chaperones, on and on and on. And I went, oh, okay. You know, that's kind of what I mean by catching the spirit. You know, when a new member comes to Rotary, ideally, there is so much going on that you can kind of say, okay, you know, this is this is what we do. You know, we do this once a month and we do that. And, and oh, by the way, yeah, you do come to meetings and everything. And that's great. And you're expected to be there. But it's all about service activity. So I don't know. Those are my thoughts. I think, yeah. um, you know, catch the spirit. Great. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Dennis. That's really cool. Um, anybody else want to add uh any thoughts about their their evolution in Rotary in terms of what they thought it was when they got in there? And as they progressed through their Rotary life, um, it started to evolve into something else. How about how about our quiet Rotarian, Alan? Alan, what's your thought? I can't really see you. But okay, I, yeah, you're right. I'm the quiet Rotarian. Yeah. Um, you know, I was in the financial services business and I was also an engineer. But uh, what's really interesting is that when somebody approached me about Rotary and they said they have different occupations and different uh, walks of life belonging to the club, I joined, I, I came to a meeting and I enjoyed it because the diversity in Rotary is just absolutely astounding. You get You get a chance to meet all kinds of different people. Uh, different occupations, different backgrounds. So instead of being part of an association with like-minded people, the only <clears throat> like-minded people in Rotary is that we all do community service, youth service. So we do have a focus of a, besides our occupation. So that's what I really enjoyed about Rotary, just the diversity and learning from everybody else. Yeah. <clears throat> Great. Great, Alan. So if you guys weren't at the... Uh... At the conference last last week, uh, Alan got the Quiet Rotarian Award, which I thought was kind of ironic because he always has something to say. So thanks, Alan. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Everybody, um, everybody told me that. Everybody You're told not that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So here, here's what I here's some sort of my current belief about, about Rotary and, and about leadership. You know, about um, about a year ago, I started watching and reading uh, this um, this guy named Simon Sinek. And if you're on social media, he has a lot of stuff out there. And he's kind of a leadership guy. And um, he has a, a lot of stuff about leadership. But one of the things that really struck me is um, he said this. He said, leadership is creating an environment where relationships and trust can grow. 
I, you know, I want you to kind of think about that one for a second. Leadership is creating an environment where relationships and trust can grow. Now, you know, this year, my, my wife Zeta was our club president. Now, Zeta has been fighting tooth and nail to never be club president. She said, I, you know, I can't do it. It's difficult. I, I'm not a public speaker. I'm, I'm not a leader. I'm a behind the, the scenes person. But what Zeta did really well this year is she helped to connect people together, right? And because her, her demeanor is kind of low key, it created an environment where, where relationships in our club uh, could, could really grow because she wasn't this sort of demonstrative leader that said, it's got to be my way or the highway. And so I think our club really flourished Uh because of that. Um, let's hear from some of you guys. Um, Lorraine, Lorraine, what do you what do you think about that? I mean, you've been in leadership roles your entire life. I mean, does that does that definition resonate at all with you? Uh, yeah, it does. And um, you know, when you're talking about Zeta, is leadership doesn't have to be a my way highway. Um there's a variety, it's the ability to read the room basically and adjust to what it is that you need to do in order to be an effective leader. So sometimes it's collaborative, sometimes it sometimes it does take a little bit of fist pounding, you know, um, especially if you've got something due that was due yesterday and you're not in. But um it, it takes it takes all kinds. And yeah. I think everybody has a leader in themselves. They just don't necessarily recognize it because they may have had really great leaders or they could have had really bad leaders and go, oh no, I don't want to be one of them. But yeah. at the same time, it's kind of like, well, if you know what you don't want to be, then you can do what you want to be. But it's, yeah, you know, I think everybody has a leader in them somewhere. I agree. I agree with you. Um, Vern, I, you know, I, I was kind of Paul on Vern because, you know, Vern came out of a career in the military where, you know, it's not really my way or the highway, but it's pretty much the hierarchy of things. Of, you know, you take orders, basically, right? Command and control. <laughs> and, and, and then coming into an environment where you're dealing 100% with volunteers, you know, who don't have to listen to you if they don't want to. What's your thought? Yep. Well, I, uh, I appreciate that. You're absolutely correct. Uh, this has been a new experience for me working with volunteers. And as Mark said at the uh, conference, we got to meet their expectations for Rotary. And uh, because it's not about the rules, I guess you could say that maybe has been set up tradition over time. It's basically, we have to focus in on the expectations of the, the members where that requires relationships and trust. Um, one thing uh, I, I've got to maybe pass on a club member of ours passed on a book to me called Managing with Aloha. Yes. Great. It's about, yeah, yeah it's about a, uh, I guess you could leader at the Hualalai resort here on the big island. And chapter 14 kind of, I kind of dog eared that. It's called Alec, Alakai. Yeah, Alakai. Where you lead with initiative and with your good example, you shall be the guide for others when you've gained their trust and respect, which fits right in with what you're talking about, Benson. So yeah. I'm kind of using this as my guide to learn how to deal with volunteers and here in Hawaii with the Aloha Spirit. Thank you. Thanks, Vern. Um, so uh, those of you who are club trainers, and we have a couple of uh, people that are on this call today. We, we have a position in Rotary that's a club trainer, and it's basically kind of a, uh, a senior person in the club that helps to uh, guide the club, you know, uh, is kind of an uh, advisor to the president, that kind of thing. And we call that person uh, in our district, the uh, Alakai, so is the, is the guide. Um, and, that's, and that's kind of their job is to uh, sort of, you know, gently guide, guide things along, but uh, but you're right. I mean, trying to trying to get uh, people to a point where um, you know you can you can create an environment where relationships and trust can grow because it's um, it's not like that uh, in every in every club. So 
And I'll, I'll have some of you guys comment on that later. Okay, so one of the other things that <clears throat> Simon Sinek uh, also says is that is that good leaders um, create- and, and Lila Berg had her hand up a little bit ago. She might yeah. have some, something wonderful. <laughs> I, <like that. laughs> yeah, and I, I can't I can't see I can't <laughs> see the hands, but if you uh, if you click your uh, your uh, uh, digital hand or your online hand, then I can see that comes up on my screen. But um, it's interesting because I I was just going to call you Lila, and I thought oh, I'll just wait. I'll wait till the next slide, and then I'll call Lila. But go ahead, you can go. Okay. Well, I I don't have that little clicker here. My my screen <laughs> says something different. I have to raise my hand, and then it comes oh, up. Oh, okay. Um, no problem. But thank you, Nancy. I I just wanted to um, build on what Lorraine had said. Um, you know, and and what I appreciate so much about you, Benson, for those of us, especially who are are not native Hawaiian but grew up here in Hawaii, we've heard words being thrown around and, and, and being used without really understanding the kauna of it, the, the deeper meaning. And I wanted to say on the slide before that perhaps it would help to redefine what leadership is. It, we have all there, you know, it's creating circles of safety <clears throat> and building relationships. But yeah. what Lorraine was saying is that we all have leadership is... Yeah. Maybe you could mention the concept of ho'omana, the, the action of our mana, of the things we think, say, and do. How do we, sh how do we show our energy, our mana, yeah. who we are? And maybe if we can redefine leadership from, from our natural perspective, it won't be so daunting. Um, I'm certified, actually, with the Y Institute in Albuquerque, which is based on Simon Sinek's work. And oh, great. Yeah. One, one of the concepts, uh, basic concepts is when we know our why, we know how to make even more impact by how we do things and what we do. And I think leadership, especially from, from our rotary perspective, is getting things done. What is it that we're going to do? And how we do it is through people. And, okay, we need to be nice to them or polite. But I, I, it's so much deeper. Yeah. And we have such an opportunity. And I know everyone on screen understands that. Maybe you could help us find the words for that. Okay. You know, funny you should mention that, but we're going to get right into that as we go further along in this. But um, but thanks. Uh, thanks, Lila. And I um, I want to talk uh, more with you later on about, about your training, because I would love to incorporate um, some of that in, in what we're doing uh, uh, district-wide. Um, well, Circles of Safety is simply a concept where you create a safe space uh, for people to interact, for people to express their thoughts and ideas um, without uh, fear, right? And so um, part of how um, we do that in Hawaii, our sort of answer to that is our Aloha spirit, right? And so Aloha spirit is, um, it's it's inclusive. And like, I, I can go in and we can talk a lot about what's your thought about a low spirit and what it what it means to you um but when i when i was reading about these circles of safety i thought you know this is what we have in hawaii we have a low spirit and then we have this concept of ohana right and so you know one of the things that i've understood and and continue to understand is that culture is what prevails going forward right so, you know, a hundred years from now, we'll all be gone, but there's still going to be a lower spirit. There's still going to be Ohana. It might be defined differently uh, than it is today. I always kind of make this joke about um, Kuleana because when I was a kid, uh, my dad would come in and give us our lecture about Kuleana, which meant all the chores, right? You know, you got to take the garbage out, you got to mow the lawn, you got to pick up the dogs, you know, whatever, right? And so when I was a kid, I thought Kuliana meant chores because that's the context in which I learned it. But now, you know, 50, 60 years later, when you talk about Kuliana, it's this deep-seated responsibility to malama or to take care of the makana of the gifts that we've been given, right? Our, our environment, our, our ocean, our people, our rituals, our thoughts, our belief, right? So that so Kuliana has a completely different meaning than it did 50 or 60 years ago, at least to me. All right. And so 
when we talk about circles of safety, Aloha Spirit and Ohana, which I feel is kind of like baked into our culture over here, we, we have that already. And we exercise it in a lot of ways, which aren't really, sometimes they're not even conscious to us, right? I mean, I do things like, like unconsciously, like, you know, when I go out to the mainland and I drive around, I don't see drivers stopping and like waving guys along. You know, they just don't do that. I mean, I don't, I've never gone into a store. I, I lived in the mainland for many years where somebody, um, uh, where, where I had one item and I was standing in the grocery line and somebody in front of me said, Hey, you know what? You only got one item. Go ahead. You know, go in front of me. I never had a cashier tell me, Oh, you know, uncle, uh, if you don't have the coupon here, I get them right here. You know, or somebody behind me said, Oh, or you don't, Oh, you don't have your, um, you know, Malama card or whatever here, use mine. So that those kinds of things are sort of baked into what we do here. Okay, so let's talk about servant leadership, right? So servant leadership, like Aloha Spirit, it's very much focused on the mutual benefit for everybody, right? And and in Hawaii, our our part of the meaning of our Aloha Spirit is really about how does it mutually benefit everybody, right? So, because when I, you know, when I grew up, I mean, it was like, <laughs> I tell the story about the, about the, this bike, right? So when I was in fourth grade, I wanted to buy this bike and it was um, in this bicycle shop in Kailua. I used to walk by it, right? So I came on one day and I told my dad, hey, I would like, uh, could you buy, get me this bike? And he says, well, how much is the bike? I said, um, I think it's $60. So then he went in, he went into the bedroom and he brought out the checkbook and he opened up the checkbook and he said, can you tell me the number that's uh, at the bottom right there? And I said, uh, oh, it says uh, 65, right? 66, something like that. He says, okay, that's how much money we have left until payday, all right, which is next week. So I can buy the bike for you, but you go in there and tell your seven brothers and sisters that they're not going to have any food because you're going to get this bike. Go ahead. And he just sat there and looked at me. I went like, uh, 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 well, I'm not going to do that. And so that was my lesson in, okay, unless it benefits all of us, you, you cannot just think about yourself. And so, you know, eight years old, I got that lesson and we all get that lesson one way, one way or another, but I thought it was kind of funny. Okay, let's talk about this, all right? So, you know, people tell me, some people tell me in uh, Rotary that, you know, you know, a low spirit, that's kind of a, that's kind of a Hawaiian thing. You know, and since I'm not Hawaiian, you know, that's not kind of really my thing. I said, no, you know, Aloha Spirit is a cultural thing. And culture doesn't have anything to do with race, right? Culture is how we behave, right? And, and you know, even if, if you were brought up in, you know, Des Moines, Iowa, you, you were raised in a culture, right? You were taught how to behave. You were taught how to treat other people. You were taught what to believe. And how we behave comes from those things, right? A lot of it is how we were raised. And so the kind of unique thing about Hawaii, because we have a lot of people here from different places, is that our, our local culture has a lot of common things, right? That that everybody's culture has, like, like respect, for example. Right? I believe I believe that the base of a lower spirit, because my grandma used to use this word ho'ihi, right? Um, H H O I I H I ho'ihi, and it means respect. And her contention was, uh, without respect, you have nothing. That respect was a cornerstone of every indigenous culture, um, and aloha. Um, we talk about concepts like you know, like. Uh, like olu olu, which is to be really congenial, uh, ha ha ha, which is to be really humble. That all of those come from respect, and without respect, you know, you, that's the base of everything. So, anybody want to comment on that, Lila? You're on my screen. You can comment again if you want. Since we're sort of digging into this cultural thing now, and I would be interested in thank you, uh, Benson, also, and, and what the other folks are thinking about because I. Knowing so many folks at this meeting, 
we we will nod and go, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. I guess the, the real question is, how do we inculcate this or how do we emanate these this attitude, if we will, or this culture in our clubs? I think there's an assumption, at yeah. least I made that assumption, that we we all live in Hawaii and so we all sort of know. Um, and I was dead wrong this year. Um, so I guess as a, as a as a as a growing leader too, I would like to know how, how do we what is this you know not promote yeah how do we grow this in our clubs right to be the right. foundation right how do we how do we um how do we implement this uh, in our clubs um, Murray how about you do you have a thought on that uh, yes I do I had to. I lived in uh, three different countries before I came to the United States by the age of 12. Wow. So to adjust to all these different cultures, and they, they were <clears throat> Holland, Japan, and Indonesia. They were totally different. And it's it was fairly smooth for me because I was young. But then again, when I met my wife, she's from a yet another country. And even though we've been married for more than 50 years, it's really hard to adjust her culture to the one that I gotten used to, which is the American culture. It, it is not easy to overcome these differences of behavior in, all, in these different cultures. Right, right. That's why. That's why you know the, you know where, what, what Rotary is trying to focus on. You know, um, DEI, right? Diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? And it's and it's really about trying to work cultures, backgrounds, beliefs, trying to work them all together so we can find a place where where we can coexist. And you're right, Murray. It's it's not it's not easy. But as Rotarians, what I see is that people, people have this um, willingness to go forward, right? They have they have a willingness to try to try to work together. So um, as part of, uh, I, I like to say one more thing. I I do a yeah. lot of international projects, so then I had to learn that the Rotarians in these other countries don't exactly their cultures are different too, and so to be able to complete the projects with them, I had to give and take and adjust to their culture. Correct. And that's, you know, that was a, that's a learning experience that never ends. Yeah. So that's why something like diversity, equity, inclusion is super important, right? Because unless we have this sort of open-mindedness, like, all right, we can, we can work with this no matter what. And that's part of our leadership style. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So Rotary, as a lot of you already know, right, they develop strategic priorities to help them achieve um, their, their uh, mission that we talked about earlier, right? And, and these four, we, we're going to be talking about them again. We've been talking about them actually for, for five years now, ability to increase impact, um, expand reach, um, enhance participant engagement, and increase our ability to adapt now. Um, you know, increasing our impact really came from polio. We made such a huge um, impact out there in the world. I mean, basically wiped polio off the face of the earth. So Rotary is always looking for ways in which we can go in the community and make impact. And a lot of leadership now in Rotary is more about how do we create impact versus, you know, how do we tell everybody what to do? Um, expanding reach is really a, about um, looking for ways in which we can connect with more people to expand our our, our membership. Um, enhancing participate participant engagement is is really trying to engage those people that are in our clubs that they're there but they're not that they're not that really active. Um, and you know those kinds of things like I'll I'll mention as we go forward they're kind of baked into our culture too. And then increasing our ability to, to adapt is really about just, you know, constantly wanting to learn and grow. Um, and that helps us to adapt. I mean, we learned that. I mean, thank God we had a we had a global pandemic, right? So we can learn, we can all learn how to adapt. 
Um, and as I was saying earlier, I, a lot of these priorities are already sort of baked in uh, to our local culture. So let's let's talk about them. And then, you know, I wanted to hear what you guys have to say about them. So I've always felt that impact was really was really for those people who were really ready to accept the responsibility of it, right? And I tell this, this story about my friend's son, uh, Kahi Pakara, who, who got a chance to actually go around the world and surf after he um, he graduated from college. Uh, and so when I saw him when he came back, I said, hey, man, how was it? How, how was the trip? He goes, hey, the surfing was really awesome. But, you know, Uncle, you know what threw me off was like how dirty the ocean was. And I said, oh, really? He goes, yeah. Man, everywhere, a lot of places I went, man, there's trash all in the ocean. And so, you know, because he wanted to make an impact, he, he started up with a bunch of other people, the Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii, which what they do is, I mean, they're beach cleanup people and they're trying, trying to clean the ocean up. But my point is, you know, here's a guy that was willing to take on the responsibility to make an impact. And any leader at any level of our organization is somebody that's willing to take on the responsibility. And as soon as we take the responsibility on, then we have the ability to make impact. So as long as we're, you know, sitting in the meetings talking about all these sort of great ideas, hard to make an impact. Right. Um, I was listening to this uh, lecture by uh, former President Obama, and he was talking about uh, you know, every day he meets with some of the smartest, brightest minds in the entire planet, right? These are experts, right, who who think about, think through all of these problems. You come up with these amazing solutions or whatever. But he says, but the person that really gets my attention, that, that really makes the biggest impression on me, is the person that says, you know what? I got that. I'll take that. I'll be responsible for that. I'll see this through. I'll, I'll head this project up the doers, right? And what I notice about Rotary is we have a lot of people in here that are doers, that are willing to take on that kuleana, take on, to make that, to make that impact. Okay, gotta, I gotta keep moving here. All right. So, so let's talk about expanding our reach, right? So <clears throat> in our, in our local culture, we have Pilina, right? And if you don't know what that is, that that's the belief that all things and all people are all connected, right? So if we see ourselves as connected to everything and everyone, then it gives us a natural, uh, you know, uh, connection or, or entree into connecting with other people to talk to them about Rotary. Now, at our convention, our conference last week, we were talking about um, our uh, the president's representative who is there, uh, Stan, was talking about, hey, you got to tell tell your rotary story, uh, talk to people, you know, people that you're connected to. Um, in our club, we we inducted four new members at the very beginning of our rotary year. And they were uh, three people, three, three co-workers of people in the club and one spouse. So connection is pretty, pretty close by. Um, okay. Any, anybody want to comment on that? Okay. I won't. I'll, I'll go a couple more slides and I'll start calling people. Here we go. All right. <clears throat> and our ability, um, our ability to in, increase our ability to adapt just comes from our commitment to be lifetime learners. Yeah. So I, I've always identified that term as kupu mao, right? So, you know, kupu is, kupu is the sprout. And when you put something in the ground and it starts to grow, what comes out of that ground is the kupu. So, so that new plant, you have to, you know, uh, protect it, fertilize it, water it to make sure it grows up, you know, strong and and uh, and it's productive, right? If it's a fruit tree. So kupu mao is really just about constantly learning, always feeling like I'm in this growth phase of my life, no matter where you are in life. And so we're going to talk about a program. Uh, Naomi and I are going to launch here. Um, a little bit later this year that's called Kupu Mao. And it's basically leadership one-on-one -on -one just like this that'll that'll go into more depth for anybody who's at that sort of one-on-one -on -one leadership uh, place. Okay. And then increasing participant engagement. Um, 
you know, we have a con we have a concept for that, and it's called Lao Lima. And you know, Lao Lao means many, and Lima means hands. So, so you know, what it means is really many hands or being able to work together. And I think in Rotary and in a lot of places, uh, we're all social beings who really need each other uh, to really accomplish um, to accomplish things. So, um, Nancy, you're on the call. What what's your thought? I mean. You know, you know, Nancy's really a shaker mover in our community over here. And uh and she does that simply because she has the ability to engage lots of people to do really big things. So um you want to make a comment on that, Nancy? Well, everybody has their different personalities, but I also think that it, it changes and grows. I was not I, I used to be nice. Uh I have a degree in social work. I used to be nice. But I became a landlord for thousands and over my 45 years of thousands of people. And I became forced to be really strong and firm and occasionally very nasty. And, uh, and so, so my sort of my personal evolution, you know, from literally from homeless to handling housing was that I had to get strong to survive, you know? So I think everybody has their own background to that. And then that I and, I and I'm I'm going to have to work on being a better leader because it, I, I've gotten so used to being, I mean, I had 35 employees, 50 sales agents. I mean, I've had all these people I, you know, got to tell what to do. So I think we, we need to all look at our methodology in order to, because of volunteers, someone told me I really can't fire them anymore. I threatened them without giving them a paycheck, not legal, what? you know? So, so, you know, so it's a matter of creating that team spirit to find the people. And, and, and I also think that um, lots of people are good at a lot of things, but nobody, including me are good at everything. So I think if I can find the person who's going to be good you know, like, hey, we're going to have this big work day, work party, something. Well, you know, my friend Alberta at 90, she's going to go, I can't come because I'm not going to be able to, you know, pick up a shovel and a weed whacker and do these things. But hey, no, it'd be really great if you could do and 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 separate out the, the task and the job. So everybody feels you ask them. I have to learn to ask, not tell, you know, what do we do? How do you do it and and ask people to become part of it and ask them for their input ahead of time so that they're part of of what's good, of what's going to take place so they're included as opposed to ordered to do something. I, I wasn't a, my dad was a colonel though, Vernon, so I, I got the military upbringing, you know so 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 I lived I was raised that way. But yeah, you know, so I uh, the army, you know, white glove inspections of my bedrooms on Saturdays, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that's where you come from. But we got to take all. And I, in a lot of ways, a lot of these trainings are trying to help me give better perspective to to getting stuff done. And and uh, and who do we put together to when we need to be the pushy bulldozer versus the nice um, person? So personality matters. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Lila's uh, laughing. Yeah. She's only recently met me. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, you know, in in uh, in uh, uh, Nancy's uh, district governor class, she's known as the bulldozer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A term in, term of endearment, though. Yeah, uh, that's term, right. Term of I, I think it's vocabulary. It's vocabulary, yeah. Nancy. That shifts yeah. everything. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, see, at our di we have all these trainings, and so we were asked like create one word that kind of describes you, and so I thought. Well, pushy, you know, um, relentless, bitchy came to mind. I thought, well, those aren't really nice. So I thought, and, and somebody said, you know, and somebody else used a piece of equipment. I said, so well, bulldozer. So now everybody of the people from the whole <laughs> zone. Oh, the bulldozer. So. What, what if you're the sun ray? You know how strong yeah. sunshine can be. That's it. Oh, yeah. That, see, I wasn't thinking. Literally. I don't know. See if I can change that. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, yeah, Calvin, you, Calvin you, got, you got your hand up. Uh, what's your thought, Calvin? Yeah, so um, I, I'm kind of like you, you know, lived on the mainland in California for a long time. Um, so you kind of compare and contrast um, the mainland experience in Hawaii growing up here. So it's interesting, a local culture, um, and I, I hear this sometimes uh, in Rotary and outside of Rotary, doesn't strongly embrace change. Um, 
in, in essence, maybe because it's somewhat generational, uh, that, you know, we, we feel comfort level with the culture of how we grew up, where we grew up, um, the social economic uh, of, a, of a family. Um, and I, I kind of relate it back to our club. We have a pretty diverse club. Um, and um, both in um, experiences, but also age too. I mean, uh, we were just talking a little bit while ago about checkbook. I don't, I think about a third of our club members don't even have a checking account. Right. So, um, right, right, you know, right. we, have to be, <laughs> we have to be that's, conscious of that. Um, yeah, that's how old I, I at, am. Yeah, when I look at the area of uh, focus of, you know, adapt, I kind of look at adapting to the extension of adapting to change. And um, yeah, I'm up there, uh, you know, on the on the higher end of our age bracket in our club. Um, but it's really trying to be uh, always open to to change. Yeah, we have some good projects we do, good way of, you know, running a meeting, social activity. Um, so, you know, I always, in this coming year, yeah, going to be pretty open to um, our, our what I call a, the younger membership or the newer membership, um, uh, and, and uh, you know, you, we read about the uh, all the different generations. I mean, our grandparents were, you know, some of them were immigrants, and then our parents were the second generation. So we 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 kind of all see that, but now we got you know, um, our our members who were born. Uh, barely in before the year 2000 <laughs> yeah so anyway that's my yeah. my input. thanks um and you're you're absolutely right right so like our local culture a lot of people um you know they're resistant to change but uh but it's 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 kind of a paradox because like uh i remember my grandma she didn't really want to change but she wanted to learn right um so if, if we came up with some new way of like tying one knot or something uh, or she saw something like that, she would be willing to change if she if she could uh, see the change, right? Uh, so I I think that's it, that's the thing about change, right? Is that you cannot change if you're not willing to learn, right? So that's why for for us we have to keep this learning cycle going because um, you know how how I was taught in you know, we, we had kind of a formula for learning, right? So my, so my grandma would say, you know, there's three steps, right? So the first one was, um, right, was uh, to listen and to watch, right? And then the second step was, which was to follow closely. And then the third thing was, which is to practice it over and over and over again, right? And that was their, their process, but none of that process could take place unless somebody had the willingness to to learn. And so that's what I think I, I see about Rotarians, even the ones that are resistant to, to change, they still want to learn. So, um, okay, I gotta, I'm gonna keep kind of moving along over here. So I'm gonna talk about uh, sustainable infrastructure and clubs. And we've talked about this before in, <clears throat> in sort of the basic things clubs need uh, to, to really be an active and we, you know, we uh, we 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 did this workshop called Vibrant Clubs, and in Vibrant Clubs, I could see a lot of these things uh, that were happening in clubs that were really moving. I mean, they had basic infrastructure, they had a board, they had an action plan, they had a reliable place to meet, they had a calendar that drove all the activities. Somebody was sending regular communication out. The core group was an inclusive group that welcomed people into the club. They had systems and processes for onboarding new members and they devoted some time to developing a leadership line. So I see the clubs that are really flourishing. They have a lot of these infrastructure places in infrastructure pieces in place. But we talked about club experience and I've been I I've, I've been actually uh, appointed by the, the district governor as the uh, action plan champion. So uh, part of what what I've been learning is how do we increase, our club experience. And so here's five things I wanna just share with you guys real quickly. What Rotary is saying is that <clears throat> people stay in Rotary because they have a positive 
club experience. Okay, so what is that positive club experience? What does that mean? And they've identified five areas in which, you know, if, if you guys put time and energy into this, that it'll maximize the club experience. And first, number one is meeting enjoyment where the meetings, the meetings are enjoyable, uh, they're relevant to people, people enjoy uh, themselves uh, getting together, the material that's presented is really relevant, people come and, you know, they're walking away thinking, wow, that was a really good use of my time, right? So uh, when I was in zone last November, I took a class from this Kelly Atkinson, who's one of the big meeting enjoyment guys, and he said, his formula was make them laugh, make them cry. When they're walking to their car, make them think, man, that was a really good use of my time, right? So focusing on the meeting is really, really important. I know a lot of clubs, they just sort of fly out the seat of their pants to putting together the agenda five minutes before the meeting starts. So, you know, you'll be okay, but, but thinking about the meeting enjoyment level of your members is super, super important. Okay, next thing is having confidence in the club leadership. So, so what, what does that mean? So that means when people are sitting in the meetings, they're, they're saying, wow, you know, our club leadership, they got this together. Our, <clears throat> you know, little things like, hey, our meeting started on time, you know, um, uh, you know, we're, we're going through all, all of the business stuff, the club has to do where we're talking about our calendar stuff is getting done um, you know projects are being managed um, confidence in the club leadership because if if you don't have that um, you know it's hard for people to really um, get behind and put energy behind something that uh, if, if they don't have confidence in the club leadership now I know many of you out there um, have conflicts at this level because you're in conflict with the club leadership. Um, and that will typically happen um, if you're in a volunteer organization. Uh, but they say one of the things is, you know, confidence in club leadership. So what that means is that the club leadership has to be out there in front, has to be open and transparent with uh, the membership, you know, has to be engaged with the membership, has to make sure that people's needs are being met. Um, the next thing they talk about is, is personal growth opportunities. Personal growth opportunities are really, you know, if you're in leadership, there's a huge personal growth opportunity there. Uh, the fact that you're, you know, we, we have this workshop to do, we have the session to do on Saturday morning at nine o'clock, that's a personal growth opportunity because what we find in members across the board in Rotary is that they want to grow, not just as a Rotarian, but they want to grow as a as a person. And I would say, like like for me in the decade that I've been in Rotary, um, you know, I've I've probably grown the most as a human being, probably in the last ten years uh, than the sixty years before that. Um, and that's simply because of the people that I've been exposed to the opportunities that I've had, the information that I've come across. Um, all right, personal growth opportunities. The, the fourth thing is connecting with other people. Connecting with other people. So if our, if our definition of leadership, which is to create an environment where relationships and trust can really grow, one of the main reasons why people stay in Rotary a long period of time is that they, they create relationships with people that that go on and on you know i mean i can say that um you know just some people in this meeting today i'll be connected to you guys for the, for the rest of my life simply because you know that's something that's not only enjoyable but fulfilling and meaningful for me so connecting being able to connect with others is really important and then the last thing and i think uh um, alan brought this up was you know doing meaningful service projects that are out there and those are the main five things that people people uh, look for when they decide whether or not um, they want to be in Rotary and stay in Rotary. So uh, let me go over a, a last couple of things. So I wanted to 
I wanted to mention these couple of things. What do you have? What does it take to be a leader? Okay. And what I see in our clubs is that you have to have a fair amount of emotional resiliency. So who wants to take on that? Who, who thinks they know or have an idea? Naomi, how about you? Because I already told you. What do you think? Um, yeah, it's hard to have emotional resiliency if uh, you have, um, you know, you're emotional. So, you know, sometimes when someone says something, you get uh, offended and then you want to quit rotary. I've seen that happen. Yes. Um, so with um, trying to build up or learning how to be resilient is, you know, let that let that pass, roll, roll it off your back. And so that is one quality that um, a, a leader can learn. <laughs> It's an important one to really have, especially if you're dealing with volunteers, right? I mean, I, I had one club president told, tell me that at the end of every one of her meetings, there was a line of people would line up right in front of the podium and they would have some feedback, some of it positive, some of it not so positive. And so at the end of it, she would go home and think like, well, you know, why do I want to do this? All right, well, you want to do this simply because you know, uh, leaders are the ones that accept that kuleana, that responsibility for making things go. And it's a, like a simple equation, right? No leadership, no clubs, no rotary. So, but you have to have a fair amount of emotional resiliency uh, to be a leader because some of you have already been club presidents a bunch of times and you know that it's, it's not always easy when people uh, either challenge you or they complain about stuff, right? Um, the second thing, you want to ask yourself if you're looking into leadership is like, you know, can I connect people together? Can I connect people with each other? Can I connect people with Rotary's mission? Because the two reasons why people stay with, um, they stay with Rotary is that they're connected to other people and they're connected to Rotary's mission. So if you're going to be a leader, one of the best things or one of the critical things you have to do is really to being able to connect people together and to connect people with Rotary's mission. So I want to kind of, we only got a couple of more minutes, but I want to flip through um, a couple of these things. Leadership is your opportunity to grow. And the other thing is that leadership is about creating opportunity for people, right? Think, think about that. Leadership is about creating opportunity. So opportunities for people to serve, you know, opportunities for people to, to grow personally opportunities for people to lead. So when you're in, in leadership, one of the primary things that you can do is create opportunity for other people. So, you know, um, and, you know, Nancy and I are going to be in the district leadership now. And so we, believe me, we're thinking all the time about um, who can I create an opportunity for that would like to help us in the district. Yeah. All right. And then two things I wanted to go over um, if you're if you're interested, and some of you are, have already done some of these already, it's the D District Leadership Academy or the DLA. Uh, it meets monthly starting uh, August to April. Um, we cover all aspects of Rotary. One of the great things is that you get mentored by one of the past district governors. Um, you have to be a past club president, um, and you get to you get to have graduation at a district conference in May. Um, Naomi, can I ask you if you could um, put the link um, to the application in the chat? Uh, sure. And, and because, um, you know, once you get past club president level, uh, then the next level up is really to, to start talking, uh, start looking at positions you might be able to serve um, at the district level. And um, and this was Naomi Naomi's brainchild here was, Kubu Mao Leadership 101, and we're going to start that in August. Uh, we're going to meet uh, six times starting in August, once a month. It's the third Thursday of the month, 6.30 to 8 p.m. Um, and we're going to we're going to basically put it out to all the clubs, right? And what we're going to ask is every president, the president of every club, recommend one person uh, to participate. So I guess potentially we could have 50 people in there. Um, but part of what we're going to do is to work collaboratively on uh, on projects or on a project so that people can really understand uh, what it's what it's like um, 
you know, basically to be able to work together. So, okay, that <clears throat> is kind of kind of the end of it. Um, go ahead, Nancy. Yeah, I got to bulldoze in here. Singapore okay. is just days away. I'll be leaving Monday morning. So, um, but we have our District 5000 dinner, which is always a really fun event when you go to international because it, that might be the only time you see the other 70 people coming over from Gila, from <laughs> Hawaii to Singapore because everybody goes in so many directions. But so um, if you're going to sign up for the dinner, that Sunday night, it's $80 American dollars, which after I've seen what the other events are charging, that's really affordable in Singapore. So um, anyway, we're going to be at the Holiday Inn Atrium, which is very close to our, our um, host hotel and easy to get to. So uh, let me know. A few people on this uh, Zoom right now have not yet signed up. So just let me know because I have to give them my, confirm my reservation count literally today, tomorrow. So um, let me know for sure if you're coming and how many might be in your group. So we make sure we have plenty of food. We are being allowed. I took the option rather than spending $60 per bottle of wine to allow us to bring in a limited number so people can bring in wine and they can bring in their own spirits, it sounded like on the last call. Not bring in your own beer, though, and um, to the dinner. So so we need to um, kind of, I need to kind of handle that. You've got to buy your alcoholic beverages there and pay the taxes on them. She just kept saying, as long as you pay the taxes, as long as you pay the taxes. So don't, don't bring it in your suitcase, you know. It would be unhappy if it broke. So when you, after you get to Singapore, go shopping. Um, and um, pick up whichever your spirits are, and we'll figure that out. There is a bar, but we've been upgraded apparently to a nicer room with really should have a great look at the uh, with great windows for the city and stuff. So um, should be good. But the bar is going to be an elevator floor down on the elevator. So um, anyway, let me know if you haven't signed up. You can go into your registration for your international registration. You can click and add that in and pay for it right there. Or just let me know, okay? Take care. Thanks. And Lila, you can still sign up to come. There's still reservations. <laughs> Everybody, if you haven't signed up to come to Singapore, come to Singapore. There is housing available. I know the Holiday Inn still has rooms. Okay. So anyway, there is, it, I think there's what, 15,000 people coming <laughs> or something. And they were preparing for 20,000. So I think with the, there's a few extra rooms available. All right. Uh, no, no, Nancy's 33,000 signed up. 33,000. Oh, yeah. God, why were they still saying it was, was under? Okay. Well, <clears throat> I'll, we'll bring in a, a futon. We'll make room. <laughs> Dennis, Dennis, you had you had a comment? Just quick question. That last slide you had, the, the one thing that goes from August to February, is that going to be on Zoom? Is that how those are going to yes. be conducted? Yes, oh. it's going to be. It's going to be on Zoom. It's going to okay. be on Zoom, and we'll, we'll, we'll send information out uh, about that. Uh, Probably beginning beginning in July. Awesome, thanks, man. Any many any more? Go ahead, go ahead, Neil. I got a couple of quick quick things. Okay. You know, Rotary has been um, at the highest level talking about the comfort and care of of clubs, and that came from Jennifer Jones. Um, last year it was it, and this year it's the sense of belonging. So each of you have the power mm -hmm. to do that in your club to have that sense of belonging, that culture within your club to make that a good um, experience for your club members. But when we look at the continuity of your club and bringing people into leadership roles, each of you can do that with mentoring um, people who have potential. So leadership skills are learned. Uh, sometimes you've got a little bit inside of you, but the skills can uh, it need to be learned. And so you have the power to, to teach and bring up um, people within your club. So, you know, Kenny McCulkane said, each of us should be looking for someone to follow us, give them the baton and let go when it's ready. But we should each look for someone to take our place because we aren't going to be um, here, the, you know, forever. And and if you've got more people to help, then it's an easier job. And, you know, talking about adapting Kelvin, you know, Kelvin's club had a satellite club in 2017. So, you know, thinking about how we can adapt, be more creative and see what your members want, you can do it. And each of you have the part to do this. 
Okay. Wow. Thank you for that motivational speech, Benson's assistant. So, okay. Um, well, hey, I want to thank everybody for spending uh, your one hour of Saturday morning with us. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always enthused to see all your faces. A lot of them I see every week uh, because you're the learners and you're the ones that will make the impact uh, in our district out there. So uh, if I don't see, if you're not going to Singapore, if I don't see you there, I'll see you guys after that. But I uh, appreciate your your uh, tuning in today. All right. Oh, and sign up for Calgary. Right. Yeah, yeah sign up for Calgary. It's cheapest. Yes. Yeah, sign up for Calgary. Well, well, yeah. So, uh, so I'm leading the charge at the Calgary Calgary Stampede, right? <laughs> and so I'll send something out uh, for all of you guys. If you miss Singapore this year, you don't want to miss Calgary uh, next year because it's it's got, according to Nancy, one of the best rodeos in the entire world. <laughs> not that week though, but we get yeah, not that week. But oh well, we'll get yeah. there. Yeah. But okay, everybody, thanks a and lot. And also, so also but oh, the, if you think you want to go Benson. to Calgary, sign up during the days he tells you, which is during our international convention in Singapore, because mm -hmm. it, if you ever cancel, it was only $50, and boom, and it, right after that, it'll go up 50 So you're in better shape. Sign up, you know, for Calgary, and then you can cancel later if it doesn't work out, okay? okay. That's, a cheap, that's the most affordable way. Okay, sorry. You'll and, hear from me on that. Okay, you guys, thanks. Enjoy your Saturday. Take care. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Safe See travels. you guys.